Well, hello and a very warm welcome to the latest in a series uh, of webinars to advisors from Smart Pension. This time we're talking about the very significant and exciting improvements we're making to our default investment strategy, uh, as well as the outlook for investment markets and the impact on defined contribution pension savers. Uh, I'm Paul Buxy, I head distribution at Smart Pension. I'll be your host today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Cheseldine, Chair of Trustees here at Smart Pension, uh, Michelle Darricott, who is our Chief Strategy Officer, and uh, Liam Moore, who is uh, Vice President in Global Fixed Income at JP Morgan Asset Management. Michelle is going to uh, uh, start the webinar by outlining the improvements we are making to our default investment strategy. Uh, that's the Strategic Asset Allocation and the Glide Path before Liam then looks at JP Morgan's uh, assessments on current markets, and then he'll outline uh, or give us more details on the uh, Global Bond Opportunities Fund, which we've added to our uh, default. We'd love you to ask questions as we go, and you can do this by using the Q&A button uh, on your Zoom toolbar. You should see that at the bottom of your screen. And if we don't get to answer your question uh, during the webinar, then we'll do our very best to, to follow up uh, with you in the coming days. Uh, during the webinar, we'll also be asking a couple of polling questions, so please do answer those as they pop up on the screen. And uh, towards the end, uh, we'll also ask you for uh, your thoughts on what you'd like to see us cover in future webinars. So let's make a start. We've got about 45 minutes today. Um, so hi, hi, Michelle, let's start with, uh, your piece here regarding uh, the default investment changes we're making. I mean, as with most workplace providers, we see a very high proportion of our savers invested in our default investment strategy, and it's therefore a key focus for us and for um, the trustees. Uh, COVID's had a huge impact on, on, on uh, our lives and had a big impact on equity markets during the couple of weeks uh, back end of March. Um, but SMART already had a number of changes planned for the, uh, the default. So would you like to start by telling us a little bit more about those uh, proposed changes and improvements that we're bringing in? Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. Obviously delighted to. Um, so we had reviewed our default investment strategy ahead of COVID-19. And at that point, we concluded that we did want to make some changes. Um, these changes were also still appropriate, we felt, post-COVID-19, and I'm going to go through some of these now. So if we go to the, the first slide, thanks Paul. So our target for the growth stage of the default investment strategy is to outperform CPI <clears throat> by 3.5% per year, and this is over a rolling five-year period. Central to our investment philosophy is very much that asset allocation has the biggest impact on performance and we do believe that ESG can outperform its non-ESG non equivalents. We've um, Our revised target asset allocation for the growth phase of the default fund is 80% allocated to equities and previously our equity allocation was heavily biased to UK equities. So we introduced more diversification by region and included an allocation to emerging markets and small cap equities. We are increasing our allocation to alternative to 20% and this is allowing us to introduce real assets with the expectation of boosting returns and providing additional diversification. In the very first instance, uh, bear with me a sec, I've just a, literally a been locked out of a technical, my, a technical yeah, glitch. Technical glitch, which was Enjoy going to happen. Just give me a two seconds. That's fine. I, I might ask Andy a question while you. Yes, please uh, do. Your yeah. computer being up and running, and that's probably regarding the, the performance target. So, Andy, are you able to comment you know, from a trustee point of view, you know, just elaborate, you know, why is inflation? Uh, or CPI plus three and a half percent, the right target for our members? Um, the, the really short answer is they think it's realistic. Um, over uh, the long term, we think that a three and a half percent long term real return uh, is uh, achievable 
Um, there will be volatility in that. We expect to see it drop below for periods, but in the long term, we think we can do it. Uh, the key is that we want to uh, come up with a sensible target. If we, we could have aimed for a target of 4%, but that would have meant having all of our investments in fairly high risk equity markets. Uh, and that isn't our job. Our job is to get the best overall return for the vast majority of members uh, in the long term, but try to avoid any uh, significant downturn risk, as we've just seen, you know, uh, a massive drop 20% in the UK uh, equity market in the last six months because of um, uh, COVID. Now we've bounced back from that, and we'd always expect to see a bounce back. We just want to make sure that members don't get caught out with that just at the wrong time as they approach retirement. Yeah, uh, really, again, really important, isn't it? When, uh, when, when your members are sort of uh, broadly default, defaulted twice, once into the scheme and secondly, uh, uh, into the investment piece. I think yeah. Michelle might be back. You might have kind I'm of back. Um, finished the, yeah. uh, the IT gremlin. So Michelle, yeah. um, before you move on from this one, maybe a quick question then regarding the, the UK allocation. I mean, um, it still looks quite significant at 19%. For the, uh, yeah. View on that? Yeah. So, I mean, we have reduced the allocation to UK equities quite significantly, but we discussed this heavily with the trustees and decided to maintain a home bias based on, you know, other considerations such as currency, volunte currency volatility. But this is something we'll, of course, continue to review um, over time. But for the moment, we decided the best thing for the scheme was um, was to maintain that home bias. Okay. Okay. No, great. I'll pick up. Um, apologies about that. It was bound to happen uh, to one of us, and it happened to me. So um, <laughs> here we go. So <clears throat> I think I was talking about alternatives. Um, we were thinking about alternatives in the very broadest sense. So. And by that, I mean diversification away from equities. So part of our alternatives allocation includes the JP Morgan Global Bond Opportunities Fund, which Liam is going to take us through uh, later. We're also working very closely with Natixis, who's one of our other managers that we recently introduced, as well as JP Morgan, to introduce more alternative asset classes into the strategy which we'll share with you um, once this is, once our thinking on this is, is further progressed. We are extremely committed to responsible investing, but without increasing investment charges payable by members. So once we've implemented all of the changes to the strategic asset allocation, then this will mean we'll have broadly 95% of our, of, of our equity allocation will be, <clears throat> will be in ESG. So as part of our move to the new strategic asset allocation, we are transitioning the assets across to LGIM's future world range. So we do believe, as I've said um, a couple of times already, we do believe that ESG will increase expected returns. So we've selected our fund range and also our asset managers on that basis. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with LGIM's future world range. They are a range of funds that combine a thematic approach with an ESG screen on companies, tilting towards those that score positively from an ESG perspective and underweighting those that don't so much. And I think they have around 28 um, ESG and transparency metrics to monitor and score companies. They also have specific company exclusions, so the companies that do not meet LGIM's requirements on climate transition. And they have a huge amount of information on their website, which I'd, which I'd recommend reading through if you get a spare few minutes. Liam will also talk shortly about how ESG is an integral part of the portfolio construction process, for the Global Opportunities Bond Fund that we're using. And given our asset managers' prominence in the markets, a very important part of their value add is active ownership. In other words, engaging with companies to improve corporate behavior. And the funds that we're looking at with Natixis that I've, I also mentioned earlier, um, very much have that integra integrated approach to ESG as part of the portfolio construction process. Michelle, just to very, very quickly, I'm starting to get a few questions coming in on, on this, and maybe it's one for Andy here regarding uh, the ESG piece. Andy, um, the question is, you know, how have the trustees 
kind of integrated to the ESG into the way the trustees think about um, governance, so state and investment principles sort of stuff, but the, the, the ongoing um, uh, assessment of managers, for example. Um, good question, because lots of uh, fund managers have suddenly in the last few years suddenly started declaring that their funds are now ESG compliant uh, without ever defining exactly what they mean. Um, we, we started looking at ESG well over two years ago uh, on a serious basis to get this uh, introduced properly. Um, we, we go to uh, really quite great detail. Uh, it's helpful to have a, an investment manager like uh, Elgin around because uh, their Future World uh, series uh, we've been looking at, I'd say, for a couple of years. Their reporting on ESG factors um, has been, uh, I have to say, exemplary. Uh, we've been able to challenge what they've suggested to us, uh, and we've always had sensible answers back. So uh, it's El Jim's job to look at it on a day-to-day -day basis on whether a stock is behaving in the way they say they, they do. It's our job to look at the managers to make sure they're doing their overall due diligence appropriately. Yeah, that makes good sense. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Michelle, a few more points I think we wanted to make regarding, we wanted to make regarding our thoughts on ESG, some of the self-select options and other commitments. So Yeah, thanks Paul, absolutely. So um, we do have three self-select um, funds available um, as part of our overall self-select range. Um, the other points I wanted to mention was that we are a signatory of the UN's um, six principles of responsible investing and we're committed to applying those principles into our portfolio construction and disclosure reporting. Uh, despite it being a mouthful, we're also committed to aligning to the task force for climate related financial disclosures as well. And we've invested heavily in the team, so we have a Head of Sustainability and um, our Chief Investment Officer is a specialist in ESG and is spending a lot of time actually looking at impact investments. So that might be something that over the longer term, you know, we look to introduce into, um, into the Master Trust as and when, you know, the, the Master Trust is of a scale and these investments start to become, you know, much more accessible to, um, to DC schemes. <clears throat> okay, another question that's come in. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, maybe again, either uh, Andy or Michelle. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, so, so we believe in it. We think this is going to give a better return than non ESG equivalents, and the trustees are very much on board. What, um, what are our members saying about uh, ESG? Andy, um, do you probably, you? Yeah, probably better if I take that. Um, yeah. uh, just under a year ago, we ran a couple of member webinars. There were um, something over a thousand people dialed into those two webinars. Um, there were about 700-ish questions <laughs> they posed to us, and about 20% of those were about ESG elements. So even allowing for the fact that, that is, this is the sort of area that prompts people to be a bit messianic and, and to uh, vociferous about it, that's still an awful lot of people wanting to know about our ESG capabilities. So we're absolutely happy that um, members are, are, are the, the members that are interested in this are very keen on it. And as you said earlier, um, we believe it's going to give a better return anyway. That's the crucial reason we've gone down this route. Yeah, so, so e even if a member <clears throat> wasn't 100% convinced by trying to invest for good, although it's hard to sort of, I may be leading the witness, our polling question coming up, I'm, I may be making this a bit harder, but um, even if you didn't subscribe to ESG as being the right thing to do, you could get comfortable with the fact that this should give you a better return than a non-ESG equivalent, which I'm guessing helps you know, quite a lot. Absolutely, and, and certainly for the next 10 years, we reckon, there's gonna be a wall of money going to ESG, and that's gonna support prices in, the, in those markets. And nine, yeah, nine, 95, nine, 95 or six percent uh, equity into uh, ESG is, uh, is, a, is a pretty good result. Sounds a bit expensive though. So um, with that, plus wider diversification to things like alts, Michelle, what, what's what's been the impact on um, on member charges? Uh, that's a good question, Paul. I think one of the things we were keen to do in terms of uh, moving to ESG was not increasing charges to members. So it's had it, it has it's had no impact whatsoever. 
in terms of the charges that our members see. So that's really, really positive, I think. Yeah, no, I don't, I'd agree with that. And I know we're making some, we're having some thoughts about the future, future fund, uh, top of this slide, uh, being 85% uh, Elgin Future World Funds, but some ideas there about sort of um, carbon neutral and climate change. So it's kind of watch this space for that. But that's probably quite a good segue to the next one for you, Michelle, uh, which is, you know, how we're thinking about using technology um, to help members who, you know, for whom this is a passion. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are very much in the development stage um, uh, around this? Yeah, thanks, Paul. That's a lovely leading. So, um... So one of the beautiful things about SMART is that whilst we're making all of these changes to the investment strategy, we're very much looking at how we can align developments in our technology to that. And as Andy said, you know, if, um, one of the key areas where we are getting engagement from members is around um, the social, you know, the ESG aspects of their investment strategies. So we've got a proposition that's in research and development at the moment. Uh, called smart beliefs um, and um, effectively what we would like to be able to do is offer members the ability to swipe left and swipe and swipe right uh, which um, lots of people are used to doing now um, in order to um, select their ESG preferences. This is very much early days in research and development but we will no doubt customer test it um, within an inch of its life but it's certainly it's not a trend that we're just seeing in the UK, it's a trend that we're seeing globally. So the US, for example, Australia, so all of the major DC markets, um, as you can imagine, this type of proposition is, is really, really interesting. Yeah, and again, it, it, it comes back to the, the point we were just talking off the back of the question regarding what the members think, and we think this could be really helpful, uh, might help engagement, because if people are believe, you know, investing in something, they feel their pension is, a force for good then um uh yeah that, that that's all powerful uh i would hope yeah. we see it from members and we also see it um employers often ask that on behalf of members as well so yes. um yeah definitely definitely of interest Indeed. um okay. that's great excellent right. um shall we move on to how we're progressing and so um you talked about the asset location i think this slide talks doesn't it about the target asset location we're moving there um, do you want to just talk about how we're doing that and the progress to date? Yeah, so we're doing this in a really uh, cost efficient way because we're using new cash flows in order to move us towards the new asset allocation. So you can see the position at the end of March, uh, which is broadly when we made um, oh, the decisions in relation to the strategic asset allocation and then the position at the end of June. So we've moved quite some distance and we've mm. been able to do that using new cash flows. So um, like a lot of master trusts, uh, we're heavily cash flow positive. So our fund size is rapidly approaching a billion and our cash flows are broadly, you know, 30 to 40% of our overall asset value. So that um, offers great advantages in terms of moving to the new strategic asset allocation. Uh, you can also see on uh, the second column that um, all but one of our equity allocations is in the ESG equivalent in the future world range. Um, we don't have that for developed small cap equities yet because it's not available. But again, you know, that's something um, we will we will monitor and see how, um, you know, see if, if and when it makes sense to um, to take that forward. That makes, uh, makes good sense. Thank you very much. Okie doke. Um, let's move on to look at the other change that we've made, which is uh, we've revised the, the default glide path or you know, the, the, the de-risking period uh, on, uh, on smart pensions. So do you want to talk about that, Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a, a key part of um, the decisions the trustees took as part of the strategic asset, asset allocation review. And we decided to, we took the decision on the advice from our investment consultants as well to move to um, the glide path of eight years. Now, of course, there's no, um, we deliberated this, um, you know, over a few meetings and there's clearly no right or wrong answer as to how long a glide path should be. But we felt, you know, that this length of time offered the best compromise. We do supplement this with a heavy programme of engagement to members. Um, from broadly their late 40s to help them prepare 
for those decisions that they need to make in the run up to retirement. So we communicate throughout, but we really hit it hard from the late 40s, because as we know, that's when people start to think about, um, you know, what they might be, they tend to be more engaged at that point in terms of what they may be setting aside for retirement. And the landing point for the eight year glide path very much aligns with our what we're calling our four pot solution, which is smart retire. I'll come on to that in a second. But we also have options available if there are people that want to put 100% in cash or 100% in an annuity. And they're very much aligned with our thinking on smart beliefs and part of a broader proposition called smart invest. We're also adding optionality for members to create their own personalized savings journeys in the run up to retirement. So again, you know, something that we're researching is in customer uh, research and development as a smart retire being for, for the last uh, year and a half. And then move on to smart retire, Paul, if we can. Mm -hmm. So um, smart retire is, as I say, it's launching later this year, um, sort of late uh, Q3, early Q4. I describe it, it's a mobile first solution and it's done within a guidance framework to help address that advice gap that we all hear so much about. So it's very much within a guidance framework and it helps members choose between up to four pots at retirement. And there are broadly, so there's a flexible income pot, call it flexi axi flexi access drawdown for your early years, a later life pot, which you can use to buy an annuity or maybe pay for later life care, an inheritance pot, if you want to set some money aside for loved ones, um, and a rainy day pot, you know, if your boiler breaks down, then you've got some money set aside for that. So um, I've been heavily involved in this uh, from various angles and we've customer tested it. I just I often say within an inch of its life and we're really pleased with how that looks and you can see that on the screen so that's a really exciting development coming soon so what um so i think is um just sorry to paul interrupt just very very quickly so that the product is is um now sort of uh aligned so that the journey you know you could argue is kind of to retirement and then out the other side albeit the member will need to select which of the pots they want to invest in. And that's where the, 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 user, in, the, the user interface that we're building that you can see on the right hand side of the slide you know, clicks in. But the major reason for mentioning it on today's uh, investment uh, webinar is just really as to talk about how we've aligned the, the new glide path. We haven't just extended it to eight years. We've also made it sort of congruent with um, smart retirees coming soon. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's spot on. Okay. So that was a key part of, um, of the design features. And you can see that in terms of the broad allocation to the, to the underlying funds. So um, now members don't have to select Smart Retire, as you say, that's, that's yeah. absolutely a choice. Um, but it, what we've done is align that as much as possible, but still give people the option to do something different. So, um, and the work that we're doing in terms of creating the personalized savings journeys will give even more flexibility around that. Um, so just getting as much. So some of the thinking, you know, that we've had, we've had in liability driven investment in DB for many years, thinking how we can bring some of those ideas through technology to our members is um, quite an intriguing development that, that quite an important development that we're working on. Right. No, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for that. So in, you know, we've clearly made some uh, some really interesting and significant changes to asset allocation. Uh, the intention of bringing in alternatives, um, you know, accessing a liquids, um, you know, cost effectively. Uh, we're not going to increase the cost to to members, but we do think that that's a, a decent um, uh, opportunity to, to 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 chase more return um, on a risk managed basis with our members. We've introduced ESG, you know, I think, you know, um, in, a, in a very progressive way. I think that's exciting. Um, uh, as you'd expect, you know, we've also got these ideas using technology to personalize the journey and to get people to invest in the, in the beliefs that they, that they, that they have. Um, we'll move on to our first polling question, if I may. So hopefully that should pop up on your screen now. So, um, yeah. Simple question, you know, we're interested in your view on responsible investing. 
uh, in provider defaults, um, a not important bit of a gimmick. I'm hoping we won't get many in that in that bucket, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll see. Um, uh, does it just tick a box? Um, or do you believe it would be a key driver of investment returns? Or maybe you don't have a strong view. Um, and I guess whilst you're uh, looking at that, sort of a couple of other questions kind of coming through. Um, a question here regarding smart retire, Michelle. So one's mm -hmm. coming through there, which is, you know, are we intending to give advisors um, viewable access to the smart retire portal for employees of their clients? Yeah, absolutely. So that will be... Um, uh, so that, you know, that's something we're working on developing, but what um, advisors will be able to have access and what members can do is effectively they can go through the, what we're calling the illustration and quote journey. Um, out of that pops, um, you know, um, a selection against each of the different four funds and that's readily shareable with an advisor so that an advisor, you know, could advise, advise on that appropriately. So. We're, we've got options, so it can be self-serve if members are comfortable doing that, or if members want to share it with their advisor, they can absolutely do that um, through sharing some of the output of Smart Retire, and we look to evolve that over time. Perfect, and um, I'll see the results, yeah. Okay, so we did get a few saying it's a gimmick. It's interesting, 4% uh, saying that, um, but I can see the lion's share kind of Seem to be in agreement with us that it, it is it's, it's going to outperform non-equivalents. Certainly, that's been our experience uh, uh, to date. So that's that's great. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question before we then get across to Liam, who's waiting patiently in the wings. If you can have wings on a mm. virtual uh, video call, um, and maybe this is one for, for for Andy. So one of the questions that's come in from. Uh, the, uh, the audience is uh, frequency of switching um, for, for when, when we're doing the rebalancing and we're doing the de-risking over those eight years. Is that carried out annually, quarterly or monthly? Um, quarterly is the target that we're getting to. Um, it has been annually in the past, but we need to get it to quarterly. Uh, um, all the modelling I've seen, and frankly this goes back 15 or 20 years, shows that the problem with monthly switching is you have to reverse switch it as uh, markets change, but quarterly is by far the most efficient. Great. Okay. Now that's, uh, that's fine. Thank you again for your questions. Please keep, uh, keep them coming in and we'll do our best to, uh, if we don't answer them today, we'll come back to you very, very shortly. Okay. So um, next part of the, um, of the meeting is to look at uh, Liam. So Liam, um, Again, we talked about COVID a wee bit, and I said that in my introduction was handing over to Michelle. Clearly, it's been the big thing this year. I mean, um, you know, it had a huge impact on on markets back in in March, but it's obviously shaping a lot of thinking as we start to, to to do our best to recover. So, governments have invested or injected, I should say, lots of money into their economies. Um, central banks have reduced interest rates uh, pretty much as low as they've ever been. Um, some business sectors. Doing well, of course, principally technology and, and pharma, but you know, some hospitality, retail, uh, notably, they're facing very, very significant threats to their very existence. Um, next section really is for you to share uh, the perspectives of JP Morgan in terms of uh, its forecasting. So I'll hand over to you. Yeah, th thanks, Paul, and uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you um, on this rainy summer's day. Um, I thought uh, what I'd do today is just share a few thoughts that, that came out of our most recent investment quarterly meeting. Uh, that took place in June. Just for context, this is a really important strategy session for us, um, for our senior investors. It's particularly important in, in informing the positioning in the global bond opportunity strategy that, that we'll talk about shortly. One of the outputs of that meeting is to come up with some broad uh, probabilities for, for some scenarios that you can see um, on, on the slide there. Um, and, and you can see on the left that the real standout on this page is that 80% bar showing that over the next three to six months, we think that the overwhelming likelihood is for an environment of, of, of above trend growth. Um, just to put that into context, long-term trend growth uh, in the US is 1.75%. So we think that we could see growth well in excess of that, um, at least in the near term. And I certainly think it's worth making a couple of points on this to, to caveat this output. Uh, first point, really, 
This came about because really the bar was just set so low in the previous quarter. So we saw those double digit drops pretty much everywhere in GDP. We saw huge spikes in unemployment. So when we look over the next couple of quarters, actually it's going to be pretty difficult not to have quite a sharp bounce back uh, in the near term. And the second point to make on this, I think, is that we're not saying that we're going to be going into a steady, strong, sustained period of, of growth over the long term. We do certainly think that there will be challenges ahead um, and we think that there's been long term scarring, particularly to the labour market. So we think it's going to take um, a very long time, anything up to a decade to close the output gap. Um, and we do expect double digit unemployment to stick around for some time. So, to, you know, unemployment well into 20, um, 2021. But in the near or, or the medium term, we think it's, it's fair to say that we are going to be in a, a better growth environment um, than we were a couple of months back. This should be a positive for, for markets. So, so that's a positive there. So what are some of the things that we're looking at to validate this view? We're going to look at some of the, the growth indicators that we're now watching. Mobility data is a really important part of that. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the policy response that we've seen so far. That's really been supportive for markets. Um, and one of the, uh, the results of that policy response is a lower for longer rates environment. And we think that this is going to cause uh, a grab for yield. That hopefully should throw up some opportunities in fixed income markets. So I'll talk about uh, couple that we're looking at. And so if we move on to the next page, um, you know, what are some of the indicators that we're looking at from a, a growth perspective? One of the key themes recently for us has been that it's been really important not just to look at the traditional economic indicators. So when we take measures like unemployment, purchasing managers indices, retail sales, yes, they all tell us something. They're certainly not useless. Um, but, but actually, it, it, they are fairly infrequent and some of them have um, a quite significant lag. So it makes sense to us to look at what we're calling real time or high frequency data. And what we're essentially talking about here is the stuff that's coming out of our GPS trackers, our mobile phones. It could be Google Maps, public transport use, um, even things like restaurant bookings on, on open table and, and things like that. So this is giving us a really valuable insight into what's happening right now. Um, as economies um, start to start to recover. And the chart on the left there um, just validates just how important that data is. We're seeing that there's a, a reasonable relationship between mobility, so economic activity, and GDP. And it's showing you that the, the countries that locked down the most, i.e. the ones that were least mobile, um, also took the biggest hit to GDP. So it's certainly a really important data set. What are we actually seeing? You can see that on the right hand side, you can see uh, just one of the measures that we're looking at. This is retail and recreation mobility. Um, you, know, you see that huge drop pretty much everywhere in, in March. Um, but then that steady return to something approaching normality um, over the past couple of months. So this does give us some comfort that we are seeing a resurgence in economic activity. Clearly, there's a key risk to this, and we are seeing an increase in case counts in the US. So we'll be watching those case counts and also in places like Spain. We will be watching how that impacts on this mobility data and whether that above trend growth in the near term is threatened. It's certainly one to be watching. So that's on the growth side. Um, those are some of the things, the indicators that we're watching. Um, what about the policy backdrop? And if we move on to, to the next charts, here, um, you know, this has been massively important from a financial markets perspective and, and just the speed and the scale of the, the monetary and the fiscal response has just been staggering. Um, what we're showing here, it's two charts, but they're, you know, they're both different, but they, they tell a very similar story. The left hand chart is showing the monetary response. So we're seeing balance sheet expansion here. You can call that quantitative easing. Um, across the G4, um, and we're looking at it in, in this recession and also in the 2008 recession. You can see in the last recession, so that's the gray line, that actually it took about five years to reach the levels that we're at now. This time it took about four months. So that's really staggering, and it just shows how, uh, how on side the central banks have been recently. 
it's been the same story from a fiscal perspective. So you can see the US fiscal balance on the right hand side, but it's not just the US. We've seen, for example, in the last week, the details coming out around the EU recovery fund, um, huge support from a fiscal perspective. So those two, um, those two uh, sides of it really show us that, that central banks and government policymakers, um, to a great extent, have, have had the markets back. And we don't expect that to change anytime soon. And if we move on, um, so the, the other part of the monetary response that we saw, aside from quantitative easing, was, of course, uh, the, the rate cuts. Um, that leads into the fixed income markets nicely. Um, really, we've seen a pretty uniform slashing of interest rates to their, to their lower bound. So we saw the Fed cut interest rates pretty early to, to almost zero. Um, we think that very much puts us into a lower for longer rates environment again. Um, and if we look at this page, we can start to think about how long we might be in, uh, in, this, uh, in this situation. Looking at this chart, this is showing you how long it's taken the Fed to raise rates in previous recessions. If we look at the last recession as a guide, as the last time that we saw double digit unemployment, Following that, it took the Fed about six years to start thinking about raising rates again. So that yellow diamond showing the first hike of, of the last cycle. So we certainly think that low rates are here to stay. That has a few implications. So to start with it, it makes it very difficult to look at, at government bonds. I checked gilts today at, at a massive 12 basis points. It makes it difficult to look at government bonds as a long-term source of income uh, or, or total return. Um, and then that also perpetuates this uh, this this grab for yield. Um, so so we uh, we think that should ultimately be a positive for for several um, several of the fixed income markets that, that we look at. And so what are some of those opportunities if we look at the next page? Um, so we're looking at, at just just two here in the interest of time. We can't go into to all of the themes that we're thinking about, but I've chosen just a couple here. We're looking at investment grade credit um, and emerging market debt. Um, on the investment grade credit side, this is an area that has seen huge technical support. So demand for the asset class has been really strong. Um, it's been a huge focus for lots of the central bank policy that we've seen enacted. We've seen um, all of the major central banks buying up great deals of, of, of corporate credit in, the, in, re in recent months. So that's been really positive from a demand perspective. Um, we actually added to the sector alongside the central banks um, very early on um, after the crisis calmed down a little bit, um, just anticipating that demand from those central banks should support asset prices. We have seen that. We've actually seen that sector recover more than 80% from the lows. So we've very much benefited from that. What does that mean looking forward? Does that mean that all the returns now now gone? But actually, we think looking forward that we should see healthy demand um, continue for, for investment grade credit for, for, you know, for some time to come. And really, it just comes down to that grab for yield again. So especially when we look at U.S. credit from the perspective of, uh, of overseas buyers, so foreign buyers, and what, this is where we're starting to look at the left hand chart here. Um, what we're seeing is that for investors in those famously low or negative yielding regions, US credit has actually got a pretty favorable yield and it's certainly spiked up um, in previous months. What that comes down to really is the cost of hedging. So over the past few months, oh, oh, sorry, over the past couple of years, it had been quite expensive to buy US credit if you were an investor looking for yield in Europe or Japan, just because those higher interest rates in the US meant higher hedging costs. But now that we've seen those rate cuts, we've pretty much seen the interest rate differential slashed um, uh, to, 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 to almost nothing. Um, that has taken away a lot of that hedging cost, which has brought, brought up the overall hedged yield that's available to, to foreign investors. So that, those higher yields should really prove positive from a demand perspective. We think that we're going to see buyers continue to come into this market, and that in turn should push up asset prices, uh, and we should see spreads tighten even more than they, they have done already. And then just to finish off um, on the emerging market side, this, this is an area which really wasn't very attractive to us as we saw volatility spike in March, just given that emerging markets tend to be the most volatile within fixed income anyway, um, and they very much depend on a strong global growth environment, which we certainly weren't looking at a few months ago. But, but now that we see that growth um, is looking up a little bit in the near term, 
um, it, it's probably time to take another look at the asset class. Um, and just from a valuations perspective, it is looking pretty attractive to us. So this chart on the right hand side is showing us the return that you've typically received um, every time spreads have reached a certain level. Um, the purple line is where spreads were at the, the beginning of the month. Essentially, every time that spreads have been at these levels, you, you, you've made a, a positive return. So that's another area that, that, that we're looking at. Just um, I'll pause there, Paul. I know we're, we're short up on time, but, um, but those we are, are just a few. We are short on time, as always the way, cramming as much as we can in. Um, we're going to just throw up a second uh, polling question, uh, <clears throat> which is just to get, to get your views on um, current markets. So second polling question, what is your view on the way the stock markets have rallied since the initial fall? So we'll leave that up for a little uh, bit. Um, Liam, before we move into looking uh, at high level at the, uh, the, the Global Bond Opportunities Fund, um, you mentioned low interest rate environment you know, being low for longer. Um, with the sheer scale of the fiscal and monetary stimulus, um, there is an argument for saying that inflation you know, is going to be a, a challenge. Do, what's, what's JPM's view of, of, of that risk? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of debate about what happens in terms of you know whether the, the policy response has been inflationary. But I think what we are pretty confident of, and the, you know the way we're thinking about inflation at the moment is that in in the short term we certainly think that this has been a very severe disinflationary shock. So just think of that huge hit to demand. That's obviously cut spending almost to nothing. Um, as economies start to recover, we're not so sure that people are going to come and spend um, spend a great deal. We, we think that savings rates should remain high. We think people could be, you know, preparing for another uh, 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 another outbreak potentially, another loss in in, in uh, household income, um, and so those those kind of um, dynamics are at play in the in the near term, which which should keep inflation pretty low. Um, I think the other thing is that. You know, as I mentioned at the start, it's going to take a very long time to close that output gap. We, we think unemployment is here to stay for quite some time. Um, and so we don't, we, we don't think there's going to be much inflationary pre uh, pressure in the near term. Whether that's still the case in, in, in years to come um, is, a different, is a different story. All right, no, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Not quite sure what happened to the poll results. They seem to, oh, there we go, as if by magic, up they, uh, up they, there they come. So. More volatility as the economic impact of the pandemic unfolds. Yeah, I guess we have to, to wait and see. We have to, to, to plan for more, more uh, volatility um, to be expected, I guess. Alrighty, we're coming towards the end. Uh, we are going to launch a survey now, just a very short survey, just to get your view on uh, what you'd like to see us cover in future webinars. Um, so please uh, let us know, uh, complete that. Liam, sh short on time, as we said, apologies for that, but um, looking at the new strategic asset allocation uh, that Michelle outlined uh, at the head of the, uh, the uh, webinar, we mentioned the addition of the JP Morgan Global Bond Opportunities Fund to bring in some additional um, diversification and sort of, you know, to, to get some, uh, some balance into uh, the portfolio. So would you like to give us a bit more information about that particular fund and JPM's uh, expertise in the market? Yeah, yeah, of course. And we're, we're really excited to be partnering with, um, with Smart on this. Hopefully, I'll just be able to give you a very, very brief overview of this strategy. Um, it's part of a strategy that's been running since 2012, so it's got a good track record there. Um, really, it's a global, unconstrained, best ideas portfolio that, 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 it, that, that, that invests across the fixed income universe. So, you know, Looking at those three kind of banners there, we talk about best ideas. What, what do we mean? Essentially, it's benchmark agnostic. So we're not bound to hold any particular asset class. If we don't like a sector, we, we won't own it. Um, it's a diversified strategy. So, you know, huge opportunity set out there. The fixed income markets are almost £100 trillion worth of, of, of debt outstanding. That means we can invest in a great deal. So we can invest across lots of different sectors and, 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 and countries. Um, some of these sectors do add something really different. So we've got expertise in the securitized markets, for example. Um, you know, that, that, that really adds to the diversification of the strategy. And then finally, we're dynamic. So we don't just stand still. We will evolve our positioning according to, to market conditions. We've got an experienced team. You can see those, uh, those portfolio managers there. Um, 
they will apply a top-down, bottom-up approach. So Bob and Ian, our chief investment officers on the left-hand side, will do the top-down allocation. So they'll decide the sectors that we go into. Um, and then you've got the security selection on the right-hand side. So the, the, these PMs will, will head up their analysts and their, and, and their, their credit research um, uh, teams really to go into every balance sheet and research every single bond that, that we buy. And we do all of that in-house. The target is uh, is of total return, so we look to get as much upside as possible from the markets um, within a volatility range of, of five to ten percent. So uh, we're looking at really um, you know, generating as much long-term risk-adjusted return as possible. And then Michelle mentioned earlier that ESG, of course, this is very much a strategy where ESG is integrated across all of the sectors that we invest in. So when we talk about ESG integration at JP Morgan, it means that when our credit analysts do their research, they are considering ESG as a fundamental input to their investment thesis. So it's always recorded and we will always be able to see the rationale from an ESG perspective. And then just to give you a flavor, clearly we, we, we don't have too much time to go into, into the details of this, but looking at the next page, just to give you an idea of how we're positioned and how we, how we do things. Um, you know, you, you've got a duration there just above five years, uh, a, a pretty healthy yield to maturity, if I do say so myself, when I talked about gilts at 12 basis points earlier, um, a yield to maturity of just under 3% for what actually remains an investment grade portfolio. So a triple B um, overall credit rating, really thinking about those risk adjusted returns, trying to stay up in quality at the moment as we have this, this more vulnerable market environment. Um, you can see the diversification from the top chart. So lots of different sectors that we invest in. Um, and then you can see the dynamic nature of the strategy on the bottom. So you can see some of the changes that we've made over the year so far, um, pretty drastic changes in terms of high yield and emerging markets there as we saw volatility start to spike. So we certainly weren't standing still throughout, throughout the crisis. Um, that, that's, uh, I think, one of the shortest pictures I've done for the fund so far, but um, hopefully it gives you an idea of, of what we're about and looking to achieve. Brilliant. Yeah. Again, thanks for, so much for squeezing uh, squeezing the, the the commentary into the uh, the time left. I promised you that I would flash up the all important compliance slides, so uh, we'll give people literally no time at all to read that. But I'll put it up there anyway. No, uh, fascinating uh, fascinating insight, I think, into the research and the, the long term forecasting that you're doing. So, you know, thank you. We have run out of time. Um, we have more questions than we've been able to pose, so we will come back to you uh, individually with those. Felt like we did cover quite a lot of ground. Uh, certainly I enjoyed it. Time flies when you're having fun, as they say. Um, I, I guess I'd like to uh, thank my panel uh, for their time today. So thanks, Michelle, uh, Andy and, and Liam, and thanks everyone for tuning in and for your questions. Uh, look out for the next one that we do. Um, you know, your usual smart contacts or through social media, we'll make sure that we get an invite to you. But I think that's it for now. Uh, many thanks. Uh, stay safe and uh, see you soon.